Okay, hi everybody. Thank you for joining us today and uh, welcome back at Vibes, the virtual behavioral economics seminar. Today, we're happy to host uh, Stefano Della Vigna from UC Berkeley. Stefano will tell us about bottlenecks for evidence adoption, which is joint work with Bujin Kim and Elizabeth Linos. Let me remind you about the logistics. We have 45 minutes of presentation, followed by 15 minutes of Q&A. During the talk, questions will be limited to clarifying ones, uh, and you can ask them in the chat. Bujin is online with us today and might answer some of them. During the Q&A instead, you will be able to ask your question uh, directly to Stefano. The seminar will be recorded and will be available soon on our YouTube channel. That's all from us. Thank you, Stefano, for joining us today. The floor is yours. Thanks so much. Um, and I'm going to talk today about bottlenecks for evidence adoption. So uh, let me just kind of uh, get straight to it, which is in um, you know many of the fields in applied micro, there has been an increased emphasis on collecting evidence from randomized trials, from RCTs that you think about uh, if you go to a development talk, uh, that, that would be the typical presentation, but same for a lot of work going on in public economics, some in labor economics, and of course, in my own field, in behavioral economics, whether it's experiments that say on better way to frame taxes to be more effective or to lower the dead weight loss or uh, how to uh, help people choose health plans that are better for them or experiments that take the form of uh, nudge interventions, whether run by nudge units or not. And of course, our CTs and, uh, you know, ensure that there is um, kind of a clean estimate of a particular treatment effect at least. But the question that has been, uh, to our surprise, we figured it wasn't really explored as much is, what happens after you collect all this evidence? Like you, you've run an RCT, you found taxes to this, you found nudges to that, and now, and now what is the next step? If you design an experiment to in, improve public policy, to change a policy outcome, um, what's the next step? What do you say? Well, it's obvious. The next step is implementation into policy, but it's not always as obvious and, and we'll get to that. So consider this example, which is a mixture of our example and other examples. Suppose a CT, or the World Bank from the perspective is interested in increasing recycling or lower energy use and decides to send a mailer or an email, let's say, which has tells you, uh, you know, 80% of your neighbors recycle at least 90%, we'd like you to do the same or simplify some language in order to achieve a goal. And let's say that you have a control mailer and a treatment mailer, everything goes out, you get to, um, you have a large sample, you get these treatment effects, you, you know, maybe send out the paper, you publish it, you report the results. It sounds like for most of us, that would be like a dream scenario, kind of we're done. But if the, if the goal was to improve public policy, you're not done, you know, you, the question is, does that improve public policy? Because the knowledge isn't per se enough to improve public policy, unless the knowledge is actioned upon, unless the knowledge is is put into practice. And so the question that we're going to ask in, in today is like, are those treatments adopted into policy? And as, as I wanna make the point right now, there, there are some interesting models for thinking about it and there is not a lot of evidence. And so that's kind of where we're gonna to try to contribute. So the most obvious model, of course, you could call it the evidence-based view. You know, you run a trial, and it doesn't do anything, so to say it's a zero. It's a you say, well, we could say we start a school. You run another one, you increase an outcome by two and a half percentage point. You're like, well, great, let's adopt the two and a half percentage point. So that would be the first starting point. Then if you come from an organization's or political economy background, you could say, you know, um, there is fixed cost to doing changes. And so some organizations are better at that. They have lower fixed costs because they're larger, they're more organized. So, you know, we'll look at that, including uh, the labor part of it, whether the staff that was involved in intervention is still there because there's buy-in and institutional memory and so on. And finally, there is a little bit of a mixture of things which have to do with experimental design some interventions could be more palatable per se, independent of the effects. And also some treatments could be closer to the status quo. I'll talk a little more about the inertia. So the question we're gonna ask is, 
Are there bottlenecks on top of the evidence-based view that stand in the way between the results and the adoption? And, you know, it, it feels sounds like it is a pretty basic question, but we there is not a lot of systematic evidence on it for a couple of reasons. So I'm going to I'm going to show you briefly just a couple of references and papers, in fact, summarized to results. But the reason it's not so easy, if you think about it, is that most of us, if we're lucky, we run a trial here, then we run a trial there, which is, in, you know, completely different. And then maybe we write another one that we never published. And like, how does that really how do you show systematically which ones got implemented or not? It takes a, an effort to find a set of comparable trials where you can expose, go back and say, okay, did you put this into practice? And so how do you get that? One example, uh, Michael Kramer and co-author of a working paper where for all the 41 USAID grants, they went back and they said, you know, did you do anything with those exposed? And so on the y-axis here is how many million people benefited from the treatment curve. So it's highly skewed, right? There is a couple that are, but basically what you can see is there's 41 of them and about one quarter of them get any kind of implementation and three quarters do not. And, and the paper doesn't really say kind of that much more, but you know, like you can think of it, this is a baseline number that we can return to that about a quarter were adopted or taken to scale, okay? Um, some other papers, like including, you know, Eva Valt is a collaborator of mine with Aiden Coville, Nakajima, Tom and Bell. There, there is a lot of interest recently in asking policymakers, if you had this policy or that policy, which one would you adopt? And it's really useful. You could have a policy that has a higher treatment effects or a policy which is from your country or a policy that is simpler to implement. And, and it, this is very useful, but it's kind of more mostly hypothetical preferences of policymakers, which is different than what we're talking about today, where a policymaker ran a trial and has to decide how to implement it. And then maybe closest to us, uh, Jonas Yor, Gautam Rao, and Moreira and Santini ran a field experiment in Brazil. This is actually a province in, in Brazil uh, where these are all the different units of randomizations, the red and the blue. And, and in the treatment ones, they invited policymakers that went to this conference in Brazil to, and they gave them information on one of the most effective Niger cities that has been replicated throughout, which is if you get the right language, you can, incent, you can induce people to pay, people that are delayed paying taxes to pay them in time. That is known to be effective. And so they give them the wording, they give them their city results. And now what you can see, this is the key table from the AR paper, the um, group that is in treatment, they got the information, they go back a year or two later and they say, hey, what form are you sending people for taxes? And they find that there's a 10 percentage point increase in the likelihood of using the nudge form that it was featured to them. So this is a case of adoption indeed. And actually they face similar issues as we did in trying to trace, how do you trace adoption without making it too obvious? And so in that way, it's kind of the closest papers. Um, but in this case, it's not a trial the cities ran. It's a trial that comes from outside and is reported to them. And I should also cite the work by Yang and Wang that looks at experiment Yang and Xiaoda Wang that look at experimentation in China, um, which we um, but by Chinese cities and like which are not our cities, but there is learning and mislearning uh, from those in years to come. That and that's about kind of as far on the policy side as we could take it now. Of course, um, I don't know if you've been following the work, let's say John List recently on the voltage effect and so on, there's a whole debate for AB experimentation in firms uh, on, on that. Of course, firms, especially online uh, companies are doing a huge amount of experimentation. Now, a little bit less obvious is what they do with that because they don't typically share the record of what gets implemented, but at the minimum, there is plenty of anecdotes of successful RCTs with interesting results that were never implemented. One of my, uh, I just cited an example. One of my, our favorite examples is the work of John Rass with Cho publishing the Reconomy Studies where he says, look, most car rental company hurts Avis budget. They actually um, rent cars only new. And after three and a half years, they resell them at their huge uh, loss because uh, cars after three years usually have lost like more than half, of, close to two thirds of the value. And so um, why not 
Cho, uh, Cho and Rice, why not hold on to them for another three years and give a little discount to consumers? And so then you, you would increase your profits by some 30, 40%. And so that's based on a structural model, a la John Russ, but actually he runs an RCT. This, this franchise is willing to change the program in a small number of rental places and not others. And it turns out, it comes out just like how the model predicted. And then you read the last page of the paper, you can see the frustration of the authors when they have to write, and the company did nothing with it. And so the point of it is there is a lot of interesting, um, whether it's a principal agent problem, in this case, like this company didn't want to be the only car rental company doing this. There's a number of interesting questions, but it's not at all obvious, not just to collect evidence, but what to do with it. And that's going to be the topic of today. Okay, so in particular, today, I'm not going to, you know, it's going to be a particular setting. The setting is going to be, you're probably familiar with the concept of nudges from the ID successful book by Richard Taylor and Kassanstein. The idea is a choice architecture that alters people behavior predictably without forbidding options or without changing economic incentives. So taxes are not nudges because obviously they change incentives. And if I forbid the use of incandescent light bulbs, that's not a nudge because I'm forbidding the use of something. But if I'm changing the wording of a letter uh, to encourage you to pay taxes, that would count as a nudge. Um, and so the interesting thing about nudges is there's obviously hundreds and hundreds of papers in the literature, but also pretty quickly they went, so to say, to scale in the sense that it, in all kinds of countries around the world, and there is like Italy somewhere in there, uh, they, there you see nudge units being formed. There are units that work in governments or alongside governments to help uh, the targeting of individuals in uh outcomes like paying taxes in time, recycling, and so on. And so the thing is the statute, statute of these RCTs, which with um, of these nudge units, I'm sorry, that started in the UK, almost always emphasized the collection of evidence based on experiments, RCTs. So these nudge units accumulate a tremendous amount of knowledge through RCTs, and of course they target policy outcomes. And so it's really a great place to kind of learn what happens with the evidence and later, uh, but it kind of hadn't been done before we started kind of a series of paper, which is the second one. Okay, so in particular, Elizabeth Linus and I, in a paper that just came out in Econometrica, we, we were able to uh, kind of uh, work with two major nudge units, uh, the Behavioral Insight Team North America, which is also the focus of today, as well as uh, OES, um, the Office of Evaluation Sciences, which is the so-called White House nudge unit, to track down all of their trials. And then we look at their treatment effects and compare it to published papers. That was the focus of, of kind of their previous work. But in particular for today, we're gonna take all of the trials run over five, four years. Uh, so, uh, you know, affecting over 2 million people, 50 plus cities, um, it, an incredible amount of uh, research transparency by these NAD units where trials, a trial report, many pre-analysis plans that made our work a lot easier in terms of knowing what outcome variable to look at. And what we had to do in, in, the, in the paper I'm presenting today is as um, comprehensive the record of these nudge units were, they wanted the cities to adopt, but they did not record it. Uh, so what we had to do is we had to, over a year of numerous contacts, we had to call back each city staff um, depart, city department, the staff member, the previous staff member, and we were trying to figure out, and we asked, we had a script, and we asked, this is the experiment you ran, that was the control, that was the treatment, what communication are you sending today, and I'll show you examples, and then is the staff person still there, and we clarified some questions, we tried to get as hard evidence as possible, and after a lot of work and, and um, you know, Woodgen deserves uh, the large share of the merit on this, we actually were able to track down all 73 of 73 trials. So we were not gonna have, we thought we were gonna have to put some bounds, but we, uh, it's amazing the amount of transparency that this, um, th these cities were willing to, and the BHE uh, contributed to this and, and so we we're able to get all of that. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you just a little more about nudge units and then I wanna say, what is the average rate of adoption and how does it vary with those determinants? That's gonna be the plan of the talk, of the remainder of the talk. Okay, 
So uh, now uh, here is the process. Uh, he, and I, I want to stress a little bit more about the process here because there is a relevant question to say, uh, how does this compare to trials run by, say, development economists with J-PAL, with, with SIGA? How does it vary compared to the experimentation that economists run with firms? And so I just kind of want to say, especially when it comes to implementation to policy. So this process was pretty two-sided matching cooperative. So there was a contact between these nine units that have become pretty well known. So like governments might say, oh yeah, we heard there is this Nigerian association. We'd like to ask him because we have this pesky problem with recruiting of a more diverse police force, you know, in, in light especially of let's say tensions, whether racial or not, we want a diverse police force that is comparable to the citizens that it monitors. And and so uh, can BIT help us? So then the behavioral scientist the IT would co-design intervention with a staff person. So they may say, hey, how about this? A staff person would say, you know, that'd be hard to implement and our lawyers would not approve that. Okay, so how about that? Okay, that would work. So how about two treatments compared to one control? And the BIT person would say, do you have enough sample? We don't wanna do things that are underpowered. And so there is a conversation, they agree on it. They would write, um, you know, a pre-analysis plan or a plan. They would run the intervention. The results will be recorded no matter what. And importantly, RCT writes a brief trial report that goes back to the city and all the way to the mayor's office. Even though, to be clear, these interventions don't tend to be very political, so it's kind of more targeted to the department, but there is a record at, at different levels in the city just to ensure that it's there. I should also say, BIT pays for the costs of uh, the staff analysis costs, so to, say the, so to say the consulting costs, but it's the city that pays for the cost of the letters and the staff people. So, so to say the costs are shared. So the city is helped in some way, but it's not a it's not a free ride for the city because to give also the city an incentive to uh, to gather the evidence. So compared to other RCTs, uh, policy change is a primary goal. Like there are experiments that we sometimes run, but we're most interested in the theory channels or something here really it's mostly about policy and, and many of the legal hurdles have been cleared by the time you get to this. So it would seem like it's a good setting for policy adoption compared to other ones, where at a minimum, it seems pretty comparable to some of the ones where you could see adoption. So what's a sample of trials? We, we basically have kind of the large majority of all trials run. The case is, this is the, this is the sample selection done exante. It's actually similar to the one in our previous paper, the blue part is identical. It's just, um, for example, there's a small number of cases where there is no clear control group. There were two letters run, but we couldn't tell if one was meant to be controlled. So we took that out because it wasn't clear what the treatment effect was. And um, all the outcomes that we look at, although we only lose two trials, are binary. What does that mean? Um, suppose the outcome is what share of police force is diverse in treatment versus control, or what share of taxes is paid in time in treatment versus control. Those are all binary outcomes because they are built up from a one zero one decision. An outcome that wouldn't be binary that is in the nudge literature is for example, you're trying to get people to eat healthier and you change menus in cafeterias or plate size. And then you measure in each plate what share of the food has high fat content. That's not zero one because it continues underlying variable. But we, we were able to find, and this is just for comparability, we're able to find binary outcomes for almost all trials. And that means that we could do, uh, everything is measured in percentage point effects, okay? And these are just trials with US cities. Turns out in BAT had a couple of trials with known US cities in Africa or charities. Just to keep it consistent, we um, narrowed it. We didn't even contact these other partners. And while looking for it, we found three more trials run by this same cities a year or two after the original ones. And so we kind of completed the record. So we kind of tried to be very much like, okay, there, there is like, there is a really clear thing. We actually had followed that. We just are gonna follow exactly the same because it's really important here to kind of have all and only the, the trials run. That's the advantage of this data. Now, here is an example of what the trials would be. 
This would be a control letter to try to encourage people to renew their license plate for the car online. So it's less costly, you don't have queues at the DMV and so on. The control letter is here. And this one's the treatment. You can see the treatment has fewer words, has a um, checklist. Like you've already read this card. All you have to do is do the insurance up to date, the emission and go to this site. And so people are like, okay, checklist are useful, planning intentions. And you see that there is a clear design. So that would be, and then they measure in treatment and control the online license plate renewal. That, that would be a typical nudge intervention. And just to give you a brief an idea, these are summary stats, like some are emails, some are physical letter, some are postcards. So some, we're gonna look later at the online one versus the offline one. There is a lot, there's multiple mechanisms. So there's a lot of simplification, some personal motivations. It's really important for you to do this, some planning prompts, some, okay. I should say, this is our coding of it and it, it was really quite hard. So um, th there is obviously some subjective aspect to it. And, and uh, it's more to say that the nudges have typically a combo of some of the, you know, what works in, in behavioral economics. And so here, for example, your checklist and simplification, it, it's, it's pretty in a way simple stuff, but it can, there is a, especially in some settings, there is room for clear improvement relative to more bureaucratic language that I'm sure as citizens, we all have experienced around the world, whether you're talking about California or talking about Italy or South Korea or some other place. Okay, so this is the, um, Column one here is basically one of the two key findings in the paper that just came out in Econometrica where we said, you know, we have a set of, in this case, 126 trials, um, but column two is only the VAT North America. You see that we replicate a very similar result. We have all the trials and we measure the effect in percentage point effect. So we say, hey, in the control group, there is an average rate of recycling, payment, taxes in time, et cetera, of 17 percentage point. And how much higher is the percentage point affecting treatment? You have to add 1.39. So 1.4 percentage point, which is precisely estimated standard error 0 0.3, so highly significant. So you go from 17.3 to 18.7. Okay, so that's improvement. So it's about an 8% increase. So it's, it's highly statistically significant. And with a good ROI, given these are very low cost interventions. Um, in the Econometrica paper, we make the point though that is clearly lower than what you would get if you looked at the published papers in the nudge literature where you would get eight percentage points. So how do we do 1.4 versus eight? That's kind of the story for that paper that I'm gonna to present today. But we think a good part of it is publication bias on the side of the published papers and then some differences in features. So there we, in that paper, we kind of, bring the two together. But here we're saying is that let's focus on the RCTs run here, what, what happens to those results. And so if you look at only the BAT North America, you get, if anything, a slightly larger effect size, also highly significant of any, you know, you still have 73 trials and you um, uh, improve the effectiveness of policy by 1.9 percentage point. That's kind of the ones that we're looking at today. And to show you this, this is like the kind of graph. Well, we can come back to this graph a little bit later. Um, this is basically show you every one of the RCTs, the nudges in our RCTs. The x-axis, just kind of to uh, fix ideas, is the control take up. And the key thing is the y-axis is the treatment effect in percentage point. So for example, these ones would be like highly effective um, uh, nudge interventions that improve the increase the effect size by some 20 plus percentage point, which is really highly unusual. Uh, these will be ones that backfire. You know, this is real data. Some ideas look like, uh, you know, you know, I can definitely think of things that I read that seem to me like great ideas ex ante, and we're not good ideas exposed. So that happens too. Um, and then you can see that there is a lot of uh, you know, good ideas in small mag that have small impact effects. So one, two, three, four, five, zero, minus one, you know, there, uh, and the distribution of this is pretty normal. If you plot it, which is what you would expect if you have, um, I mean, it's skewed, but it doesn't any, have any discontinuity around statistical significance because this is the whole 
a, a file drawer of experiments. There is no selection here as we document in the uh, in, in the in the color matching paper. Okay, so these are these are all the. So now what you might the way you might ask the question is which ones of this this one get implemented? Does this one get implemented? Did this one get implemented? That's like basically what we're after today. Okay, so um, it, it, this is just like, it took us a few calls to get in touch with the city. There is not that much more uh, that uh, that says here. Um, kind of one more thing, this is something methodologically that is close to my heart, but we, um, I hope to convince you that this is something useful. So we, um, most of us academics have had at least once in our lifetime, the experience, it usually happens pretty quickly uh, of presenting results we're very proud of. And somebody in the audience raises their hand and say something like, we knew this already. That this is like, you know, and usually that's meant as a takedown. It's like, your paper isn't that useful because we knew it already. Um, so the problem is, Often that is not true, it's just hindsight bias, right? Exposed, everything sounds like clear, but it wasn't clear ex ante, but the ex ante is long gone once you present. In fact, the better your paper is, the more that's gonna happen because you've really convinced people that's the right way to think of something, right? So how can you, and, how, and, and that could lead to selective publication. People be like, oh, that's obvious, this doesn't deserve so the way we propose is there is a simple solution to that. Just get priors exempted. Just ask people before the results are known, what do you think you will find with this design? And so that's what the social science prediction platform, which is open and free, there is like this kind of a screening, but I think where we got a great help from uh, sort of, you know, an array that helps like kind of clean up the projects and um, so Eva Vivalt and I are the PIs of this. And so you can you can Google it. That's like, this is what the platform looks like. Um, we're growing this to scale. Anyway, this was one of like some 40 plus projects that have been on the platform in its uh, one and a half years of existence. And so we posted it there. We advertised social media. We got about 120 response, 118. And so I'm gonna compare each result to the prediction so that you can also say, what were people expecting? What did we find? Now, time for me, definitely time for me to show some results. Okay, so uh, what is the adoption? How do we code adoption? At least one nudge treatment arm has been using communication from the city department after the RCT. So there is a little bit of detail, but without, in the interest of time, uh, let me show you the example that I think makes clear how most cases are. This is another nudge control. This is control, this is treatment. You can see the difference. You can see the box here. You can see the box there, the, the, the bolded parts that are different. And this is, this is in 2017. This is what it looks like five years later. It's very clear that it looks like the treatment. It's still got one box here, the other box there. It's got the bolded. This is a very clear case of adoption. In some cases, the letter the year after will look instead like control, or there will be no letter. So in general, there are pretty, there is only a small number of ambiguous cases that we had to go through very carefully. Okay, first result. What is the share of RCTs that were adopted? You might say compared to what? Well, now we can compare to the forecast, or you can compare to how many RCTs had at least one positive treatment arm. That would be 78%. What we get is 27%. So the, the, the blue one, the light blue one is gonna be the, the result. So 27% is the shared up. It's about, a, it's a bit more than a quarter. So it's not zero. It's also not hundred percent. It's also not 78. So, so that means that yes, a quarter of ideas get adopted into practice and three quarters do not. And, and three quarters would have been positive added value by the treatment effect. So what's, what's, what's standing in between more adoption, okay. So that's the key part to the paper that I'll, I'll get to right now. And hopefully having set up the, the context for this. But before I show you those uh, basically like six uh, histograms, which have the same inner shape on the determinants, before we asked, we gave people in the forecasting, what do you think of the, we asked them, when cities do not adopt the nudges, what do you think are the main reasons? We wanted to see what people were thinking before we primed them. And 
most of the things people come up, this is like the, uh, the word cloud that comes out from the, if you extract the, um, you know, the roots of the word from just what people write is like uh, a small effect size, a lack of effect, uh, they, uh, the small, the inertia, people are worried about inertia. Um, they're worried about people and stuff. You know, again, here in effect size, they're worried about uh, bureaucratic hurdles to implementation. So kind of a lot of the status quo, a lot of the things that I'll talk about later have come up here, which, which we were happy about because of course we could only focus on some dimension, especially because we pre-specified like, this is what we're gonna ask the forecasters. Number one, this is the forecast. So the, on average of forecasters expect that for zero or negative effect treatment effects, there will be an adoption of 11%. There will be an adoption of 23% for positive but insignificant. And there will be an adoption of 47% out of trials that are positive and significant. The reality is it's really pretty flat about 25 to 30%. So on statistical significance, really, we're kind of getting kind of almost no slope. Now, on effect size, there is a little bit more of a slope. So this is the expectation of forecasters. And it's flatter in reality, but we do get a margin, almost marginally significant uh, impact of when you split by thirds by effect size here. You see there is 24, 25 in each bin. This is the effect size. These are the ones that are basically negative or zero. These are the smaller ones and these are the bigger effect sizes. There is an upward slope, but at the same time, if you look at the bin scatter, it's actually, it's, it's pretty mixed. It, it, the, 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 bit, the, the thirds make it maybe a little more monotonic than it really is in the data, but we didn't wanna mess with it. We just said, we'll do thirds and we did thirds. But I would, we would say the first part of it is, there is some positive slope with effect size, but it's not, uh, it's, it's quite mixed. It's not overwhelming for sure. Okay, so now suppose you're the political economist to say, okay, state capacity, the ability of organizations to adopt experiments, it could really matter whether the city is, is larger or smaller. This is like, if you want the Besley person theory of it or political scientists also. And, you know, qualitatively it does go the right way, 10 percentage point for the bigger cities, but it's, um, it's, it's fairly moderate and not statistically significant. There is actually a related one, which is the BIT North America, the consortium uh, grades, so to say cities, gives cities some certification if they're evidence-based. So that sounds like just like what you'd like to know, like a city seems to run experiments collected um, does that predict adoptions? And again, these are the forecasters. Uh, what you observe is like not that much, just a pretty small six percentage point impact that is clearly not significant. I'll show you something that is significant, it's coming. But uh, it's um, the, the last part of this is what about the staff retained? This is some people think this is absolutely critical for good reasons. They say, hey, having the person that ran the experiment is the champion for it and the institutional memory and all of that. And there is, you know, some evidence in that direction that this matters. You go from 19 to 33 at the margin of significance, whether the staff person is still working there as far as we could tell after the experiment in the same city department. So, so these were evidence-based organizational features. The last one is experimental design, two more things, and then uh, there will be a key message I hope that, that we can that we can get. So the first the one here is are there some behavioral mechanisms that are more palatable? Even setting aside the effect size, simplification seems less controversial than things that would be like most of your neighbors are doing this. People might not like to know what most of my neighbors are doing. And so there is a little bit more of an impact of simplification relative to the other ones. This one is right in line with what the forecasters are expecting. Although uh, it's like, it's kind of on the margin of, uh, you know, it's not quite significant. So now this is gonna be the elephant in the room. And interesting is one that the forecasters expect, you know, a certain impact of it, but um, not huge. And we kind of almost struggle whether to keep track of it or not. It's like, so let me explain what it is. 
Suppose that in a trial, BAT and the CT send reminders for timely utility bill payments. There's two kinds of experiments that, that are run in practice in this setting. Okay, and I wanna explain the difference. One is new communication. It means the CT did not use to send you a, an email or a letter if you weren't paying the utility bills in time. And now they do it as part of the trial they might have a control letter that is more basic and a, a nudge letter, or they might have a nudge letter compared to nothing. That's the new communication, which BIT went in saying, oh, we're excited especially about those because we're trying something new. The other one is pre-existing communication. Every year, February 15, the city sends a letter for time utility bill payment. But now what they tweak is how the letter is written, like the bureaucratic one versus the nudge one. Okay, and this is the stunning, at least to us, and it seems to the forecasters to affect size. So for the uh, trials that were basically new, so no, these are the new ones. These are the ones that are known pre-existing. The share of nudge treatments that were implemented was only 10%, 12%. So six out of 52, really low. Instead, for the ones that were pre-existing, the share implemented is 67%, so 14 out of 21. So this thing in, you know, in regression is gonna have a TO4. So basically it turns out, and like the experts are expecting the right dimension, but nowhere near they're not expecting it to be the, by large, the strongest determinant. And you're like, well, if you're like us, we're like, what's going on here? What's the explanation? Why new versus pre-existing? But before I get to that, let me show it's not a fluke. If you put in a regression, this is pre-existing. It's got a T of four, right? And it, it gets an R square of 34%. And basically nothing else matters. I mean, this is like, I've rarely seen like, it's just, and this thing you can put all kinds of fixed effects. This is like real, okay? It's like the other things are a little bit, but pre-existing communication uh, is, is, is carrying the day. So what is this pre-existing communication versus new? So again, it's not differences in effect size because you can control for that. Okay, three main possibilities, and that basically takes me to almost the end of the talk and then just implications. The first one, let's say our colleague Fred Feynman thought, so, you know, uh, maybe this is just a better proxy for state capacity. So maybe the cities that were sending pre-existing communication are cities that are more organized. That's why they were sending pre-existing communication and that's why they're better at adopting, okay? But for that, we can put in city fixed effects, which is what we did right here, in fact, the CD fixed effects here um, in these columns, and it doesn't change anything. We can also control for area communication. That doesn't seem to be the case. So the second one, this is like um, very, very, another very reasonable interpretation is, look, for pre-existing communication in the budget, there is a line for every quarter or year you send the communication about utility bills. But if you have a new communication, BIT comes in, the city is paying the one-time cost of the, of the new communication, but maybe they don't have the line item for the years after that. So it's, just, it's a cost problem. Now, of course, it's less of a cost than most of the JPAL and Sonar cities, but still a cost, which is why we split it by physical mailers where the cost is, you know, the letter, the envelope versus online and text where there is no marginal cost. There, you know, there is some fixed cost, I agree, but there is no marginal cost of the extra mailer. And what you see is that the difference between new and pre-existing that you see here is basically the same in the two groups. So it doesn't seem to us to be the marginal cost of this. So what we think is going on is the following uh, is, is more like it's still some version of cost, but we like to call it organizational inertia. So here is how here is how we think of it. Okay, so we think of it more or less as follows: If you have pre-existing communication, there is a routine that says every February 15 you're going to send the letter 
to the citizens about this. And so when the next year comes around, actually you look at the results and you say, okay, we're gonna send the letter, what letter should we send? And you say, hey, last year we did this trial, there was this better nudge letter, let's use that one, right? So in fact, that's where the adoption comes in. For the new one, instead, you like, uh, people like, oh, um, oh, remember last year we sent the letter. Yeah, I know, but now we have some other deadline. There is no obvious, like, there's no obvious setup to put that into recurring practice. It's almost like default effects work against you because it was a new thing and there wasn't an obvious way this was embedded into government practice. And we all know how everybody is busier than they should be for their own good in governments as well as in the academia, et cetera. And so that falls by the wayside. Now, if that is true, if that is true, that this, so this is the new versus pre-existing, okay? This is the replication of the key result. Now I'm gonna show you the, the, the right set of arms. What is it? This is like, do you send any communication that you're after, nudge or treatment, anything? And what you can see is that the 12% is identical in the two. What it means is that when you do the new trials, it's not like the next year you say, okay, yeah, let me send the trial, but let's not use the nudge arm. You just don't send anything to people. Like basically this is like a breakdown of communication. That's what we think is organizational inertia. You're just, uh, um, you know, you in 12% of cases, yes, you do. But in 88% of cases, you basically never, send any more the kind of email or letter that you were sending as part of the journey. And that's why you don't implement the nudge. It's not like you, you forgot about the nudge or you didn't like it. It's more like you never get to the stage or send the communication again because your organization inertia is working against you. So that's what we think is the key takeaway here that when you're sending, when you're setting up a trial, it actually takes, uh, not just getting the experiment, but setting things in place for the future to happen in the same way. So let me just kind of show you the implications so that I wanna make sure to leave uh, time and to finish in two minutes. Yeah, but, um, and then please be, ask if this uh, organization inertia is not even clear, but um, so this is like the all the trials we ran, the cities ran, and uh, this, Counterfactual 2.7 is if all the trials with positive effect size had been implemented and you assume the RCT effects are constant over time, how much would you have improved government functioning in percentage point? And the answer is 2.7. So you would have, which is pretty sizable, you use the good ideas and not the bad ideas. In practice, instead, this is how much we compute you improve government functioning is actually only about a third of that. And why? Well, because a lot of good interventions were not implemented. And we think because of this organizational inertia. And to kind of show more on the organizational inertia, when you look at trials with pre-existing communication, there isn't that much of a difference between the observed and the counterfactual. They're really close because there is a lot of adoption for pre-existing communication. But if you look at trials with new communication, is just basically zero. It's like you get only one tenth of the potential benefits from the new communication. It's like 0 0.3 versus 2.4. And so uh, the implications of this finding, as far as we can say, we can think of at least three. The first one is, um, well, we just haven't studied very much this kind of bottlenecks, whether in policy organizations or in firms, like what stands in the way between RCT collection, the evidence, and the implementation. The second one is when you design trials, you might want to think about it. You might be super excited about an arm. Now, it might be good for like research purposes, but if your goal is policy improvement, you might not even want to do an arm that you're suspicious the city will not or government will not be able to follow through. So, because the bottleneck seems to be real. And so, for example, in our case, you might want to do more than one than pre-existing communication. The other thing is, of course, that you could also build in this good thing and you could say, you know what, we're going to come back. When is the next time you would send this letter? And we're going to be in touch a year from now to kind of make sure to create that deadline or how would you create a pathway such that a year later, this information would be used before you run it? Like, because otherwise we shouldn't be running this. Basically to say these bottlenecks are really material. 
And so uh, kind of let me just let me just wrap up to say, so in other words, this is like nudges, hyper nudges or nudges 2.0 in the sense to say, look, when you do nudge units and so on, you have to put in the nudges also for the cities in the architecture design of the experimentation. So the evidence will be used. You can't just assume it will be used, which seems like totally obvious, but you can think of it as, you know, Richard Taylor's take on this, for example, is like, well, the choice architecture of experimentation that also should be done for humans and not for econs. It should be done in a way you can follow through. So as, as the last thing I wanna say is this thing, which we show for policy is likely true for firms too. Now, we, not, we don't have data on that, but let me point the following. Firms are excellent, the online ones, in having platforms that allow you to randomize. For example, your Lyft, you can, you can um, automatically vary what screen the drivers uh, or the consumers see and run experiments. But what's not at all obvious is what do you adopt? You run so many experiments that it might be like a fairly idiosyncratic which ones you actually choose to adopt and which ones you forget you even ran that experiment or something, right? So some of the things that are going on here may well be going on in firms too. Anecdotally, they certainly do. Unless somehow the platform is set up such that the arm that is winning that race gets implemented by default as the new, as the new arm. So we'd love to think of that as a parable which, which some online companies are using. And so as a parable for what we'd love to happen here, is there any way when you run RCT and if an arm is successful that it almost becomes a new default? Like, because that's gonna dramatically improve we think the, the rate of evidence adoption. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefano, for a very interesting talk. Uh, we're gonna start the Q and A. So if you have a question, you can raise your hand or you can unmute yourself directly and, and ask a, a question to Stefano. Questions. Uh, I have a question. Um, yeah, please go ahead. Is there possibly another interpretation of the these uh, significant uh, driver of adoption um, and past uh, usage of these nudges as a proxy for uh, the organization, uh, organization's priors on what will work, be successful, and does this be evidence of uh, confirmation bias? So um, it's... Um... The, the, the key, yes, I think there is an important question about priors. There could be some buy-in by the organization, there's no question. Um, just to clarify though, the, the pre-existing communication versus new communication, that was kind of pre-nudge intervention. So it was more like uh, the city had been sending these letters for license plate renewal versus had not been sending this. And in both cases, they now are trying to say for the first time, in many of these cities, the first time they do an edge experiment or one of the first two or three times. And um, so I, we kind of think in both, uh, our interview suggests that they were, they loved the, the, the nudges and, and so on. It's just like in the case where they didn't implement, they often told us, oh, that was cool. But somehow, like, yeah, we never got back to that. Or it, it's more like they recall the results, typically they, um, so it, it seems like it was less like what they thought, how effective it was and so on, but kind of more like when they didn't implement, it was often like something stood in the way of that. And, and it sounded to us like uh, that what there wasn't was, you know, they would, they would have had to get organized for this. And so it, that seemed to be more what's going on, but um, feel free to follow up if there was uh, some more you wanted to ask. No, okay, I see, I, I see what you mean. I mean, another, maybe just a, uh, an underlying mechanism, even if your interviews seem to point uh, to another action, is that there was already a champion for this uh, um, policy in the organization. Somebody has had this idea before and maybe was looking for a validation or was um, 
emboldened by the result of the of the RCD and, and continued championing this within the organization with respect to a completely neutral um, staff without a preferred option to start with. Yeah. Yeah, and the staff member had some impact and we, we have it on the agenda to look at interaction between that. But right, actually right. kind of interestingly, the new experimentation in a way, those were almost the harder to buy into because the city was sending things they never sent before. So in a way they probably had even more buy in there and yet those are the ones that don't get implemented. So it seems like- Interesting. Uh, Peter? Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, wonderful. Thanks so much. A really uh, wonderful talk. So Thank you. I was trying to think, as I'm sure you've thought much more about uh, what, what, is the, what is the benefit or what's the payoff for the policymakers to adopt the decision? And one obvious payoff is, is or obvious, I don't know, but it's certainly part of the equation, is, is the political payoff, right? Um, if it's about bureaucrats, there's something about um, their incentives. Uh, if there is accountability towards uh, uh, elected officials, the, the electoral cycle is going to uh, play uh, a big role. Uh, I know, I mean, the number of observations is not huge to look at, at the heterogeneity within that, but, but do you have any feel or have you managed to look at patterns in the data? Yeah, thank you. Um, the electoral cycle is one we talked about, and maybe we could go back and try to measure whether there would be next round of election. In general, um, we, so a couple of things. So these were outcomes that the staff in that department, this usually was, it's not as a mayoral level, but really had been trying to work on these outcomes and that was something that bugged them, then they couldn't get the, more taxes in time, more recycling. So those were outcomes generally of interest to to them, they also typically, with maybe only one exception where there was some controversy about voter registration, there were nonpartisan outcomes on which, partly by because those were the outcomes that were interesting, second, because those were the outcomes that cleared legal and political constraints to run an RCT. I mean, you never get to the RCT level unless that, it seems like incentives were aligned. The city wanted more why variable and the Nudge unit was happy to experiment. So it, there wasn't an obvious political kind of constraint. And um, again, only one case did we hear that there was some political controversy because of a voter registration. All the other cases, they were like, oh yeah, no, we, they, like, it, it didn't sound, it sounded like somehow somewhere some obstacle blocked the road more in terms of inertia behavior as opposed to like, political lack of will, uh, but we'll try to think some more whether we can do something with um, re-election, but this typically were staff, career staff people, I think, um, that were, uh, I think, partly at least, I think. Um, and, and, and I think and that that's great. And I think also like in the terms of like, it's relative benefits, right? It's maybe of, I mean, many of the projects I think for policymakers seem to be of genuine interest but there's a horse race there's only as you said like they're so busy there's only so much you can do yeah and so much depends on what else yeah. is going to be salient um yeah. to to for instance to the electorate or to the environment yeah tot i totally agree that this is the organization inertia is like what's going to be salient um six eight ten years down ten months down the line and now you've forgotten your end this experiment i I agree that that's kind of what's salient, and I think for the pre-existing, what saves that is that they do know in the calendar of the city there is this annual deadline or quarterly deadline, and so uh, yeah, I think that that's basically what exactly what we we think is going on. Thanks. Yeah, I'm done. Yes, uh, thanks for the interesting talk. Just wondering whether, uh, is it from no communication to some new communication or is changing the media channel, for example, would you expect it to be somewhere in the middle? For example, you send a physical mail message or you move to text messages or emails? Or do you have any evidence on that? I mean, is that, uh, it seems like you had either no or pre-existing. Mm -hmm. Would you, do you know, did we ever have, maybe you would know better than me the answer to this. 
So I, I'm not quite sure if I answer completely, but I think um, in most of the cases, the adoption was the same medium as was used in the trial. Um, I think I can think of one in which they moved it from a physical to an email, which had the same exact template. Um, but for all the other cases, I think they they kept the same template that they're using before, just maybe because that was the routine that they had become used to. Thanks. And I think we can, one other you know, version maybe of Amno's question is, do we ever have cases where the CT used to run write letters, but for the trial, they're writing emails instead? Because that would fall in between pre-existing and new. Maybe there was those, I never thought of that, but that's a good question. I, and if anybody knows, you would know the answer to that. Yeah, I think there were two trials that used both an online or physical mailer, maybe one or two that used both. Um, in addition, I think they sometimes did add new mediums within the trial, uh, but it was the cases I can think of are they were sending a utility bill and they added an insert. So they, it stayed within the physical realm most of the time if it was pre-existing physical. And if it was pre-existing online, then it stayed within that realm too. Um, so yeah, the, yeah, I, those, those are the cases that I can think of. Thank you. Great. Uh, question. Go ahead and yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I have another question. In uh, how do you think uh, these would uh, um, extrapolate outside of the municipalities? Is there any reason why we should expect? Uh, any of these uh, not to apply to NGOs or um, federal or country level uh, or organizations or governments uh, or, or firms, or do you think uh, these drivers are more pervasive? Wujin, do you want to take, given I already talked a lot, do you want to take these questions? Yeah, so that was, that's a great question. That's something that we are, we were interested in and how, what should we expect in, in firms or other levels of government? And so we did ask maybe just one piece of evidence on this question is we did ask in the forecasting survey uh, to these expert forecasters, what if there was hypothetically a similar representative sample of trials that uh, firms had run, or A-B tests in large firms, or you can think of the development RCTs um, and the rates of adoption in, in low income countries. How do you think it would compare to our sample of, of nudges with US uh, cities? And I think the bottom line is that they think firms would be have higher rates of adoption and be more responsive to evidence. Whereas they think that for development RCTs in local countries, the rates of adoption will be similar and the responsiveness, responsiveness to evidence will be similar. So and whether they're right or wrong, I mean, that's, that's the next, I guess the next frontier that we can look into. But this is what people at least think. Uh, what they expect. Awesome, thank you. Um, it's almost five in the UK, so uh, we can close it here. Thank you so much, uh, Stefano and Bujin, for, for a great talk, very interesting thought. Um, thank you, everybody, for signing in, uh, for tuning in today. We're going to reconvene in two weeks with uh, Catherine Eckel. Have a good rest of the day. Cheers. Thanks so much. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Vigi. All right. Uh, so you guys are working on a paper now? 
Yeah, trying to trying to write it. Yeah, um, we should stop the recording. <laughs> oh, the recording, yes.